Scene. We're going to talk about how we can intervene with joint preservation techniques. Aren't these new techniques or has it, have they always been around? The key to all of these techniques that we talk about is, is there an evidence base uh, for them and what does the future hold? So this is a common scenario. So we've got Mrs. JB presenting to our clinic. She's 43 years of age and she's got knee pain. Now, the history dates back about five years uh, with a background history in her early years playing competitive netball. The pain's now keeping her up at night. She's taking regular paracetamol ibuprofen to help with her pain. And she's really finding it difficult um, to do her day-to-day -day activities, including her job. She's got background history of mild asthma and, and depression, osteoarthritis. We, we um, underestimate how much effect it has on um, people's mental health. Um, she takes uh, salbutamol and sertraline for her depression and work is in retail, so does a lot of walking around, uh, smokes 10 per day and has got two children also um, to look after. And this is the situation. So uh, we've, we've got these x-rays in front of us and uh, the patient in front of us. And what we see is, is that um, she's got, Mrs. JB's got varus alignment and that means that she's bow-legged. And you can see the x-ray on the left, what I've done is drawn a line from the center of her hip joint down to the center of the ankle joint, and it actually goes to the medial aspect of the knee joint. That is known as the mechanical axis. So for every, every step that she takes, she's putting more pressure through the medial aspect of her knee joint compared to the center or lateral aspect of the knee joint. And this is really important. So... Is this a common problem? And what's currently going on within, within our practice? Well, osteoarthritis is huge. We see it all the time. It affects 17, over 17 million people in the UK alone, with over 30 million working days lost every year because of ongoing pain. It's got the third highest spending bill in the NHS at £4.7 billion. And we know that people who have osteoarthritis have a 20% lower rate compared to their healthier equivalent. And up to a quarter of these patients will retire sooner. It, it, it affects the country equally. And you can see on this, um, on this chart, on this uh, diagram, England, Scotland, um, Wales, and Northern Ireland, it roughly affects somewhere between 25 to 30% of the population. It tends to um, have a higher female um, prevalence compared to the male prevalence. And we know that it affects people at various ages. We tend to think of osteoarthritis as a um, disease of the elderly, but actually you can see from this chart based in the UK that a significant proportion of these patients are aged between 45 and 64. As you get older, the, the incidence does increase. And, and sadly, once again, it does affect the female population more than male. And we know it, is, it does affect the deprived more than the less deprived. We don't completely understand why that's the case. Is it to do with um, diet? Is it to do with the kind of jobs people do? We, we simply don't know, but it does definitely affect more deprived areas. The numbers of joint replacements are in, uh, in the UK are absolutely huge. So in 2016, these are figures from a few years ago, over 100,000 hip replacements and 108,000 knee replacements were performed. 
So that, and that number is increasing year on year. Out of those numbers, the vast majority have osteoarthritis as a diagnosis. And the BMI for these patients is uh, in the range of 30, which is classified as obese. So you can imagine this is a real big problem and it does affect people with a high BMI. It's the same data for hips. Um, you know, the, the majority of the diagnoses are osteoarthritis. Once again, the BMI is not quite obese, but overweight. And these are the age groups on the right. So the volume of surgery is, is absolutely huge. And with the modern technology of joint replacements, we're doing more ankle replacements, more shoulder replacements, and not so many elbow replacements, but this is definitely becoming um, so a bit more of a regular procedure. So what is the happiness curve of a total knee replacement? I think it's a really important diagram. You can see here that only 10% are really happy with the outcome of knee replacement surgery. That's terrible. That's a really bad percentage. You would not be happy with those odds. We know that between 75 to 80% are glad they got it done, but uh, for that, but you know they still don't feel like it's a normal joint. This graph doesn't apply to hip replacements. With hip replacements, we know that the um, patients find that their hips are almost like their normal hips. But the most interesting thing is on the left side of this chart, up to 15% are considered failures, of which 2% have got significant complications. And that's quite important to, to know that actually. Really, when I see my patients, I will say 10% will be delighted. I would hope it's more than that, but this is based on data. So what is the summary of the National Joint Registry? Well, we know that um, if you, depending on your age, so if you're of a younger age and gender, um, can influence the risk of revision surgery, with younger males more likely to undergo revision um, joint replacements. We know that the revision rates uh, go up dramatically if you're under the age of 55 compared to somebody who's over the age of 65. And the risk of revision rapidly declines uh, if you're above the age of 75. We think as time goes on, the, the joint replacements are only going to increase in the number that we perform. It's partly due to having an older population and arthroplasty just being a simple solution. So when you run out of things, um, to help your patients, no matter what their age is, you start thinking about replacement. What we're trying to do between myself, um, Adrian, who I, whose fellow I was, and we learned these techniques, and the wider joint preservation community is to try and reduce the amount of joint replacements that are being performed and consider joint preservation techniques. So take home messages from um, doing joint replacement surgery in young patients is that there's a high risk of revision surgery and it's between um, close to one in three in those who are aged between 50 and 55. And that risk rapidly declines over the age of uh, 70. Um, so patients over the age of 60 have at least a 35% increased risk of revision. Um, and it's normally at around five years, which is no time at all that the patients require revision um, surgery. So with a younger population undergoing joint replacement surgery, it is likely in their lifetime that they will outlive the, um, the implant and that they will require revision surgery. And if they're really young, they may end up requiring it on two, um, two occasions. The National Joint Registry quotes a failure rate, and this is quite useful for when you're seeing your patients in clinic and you can say to them, you know, the risk of failure at 10 years is at around 5.7% uh, for hip replacements and around 5% for, um, for, uh, for knee replacements. And uh, we, we know that if you're younger, that this is going to be um, much higher. So what are the alternatives? Well, first, let's see what happens when you develop osteoarthritis. We're going to go back to Mrs. JB. And as I showed you, she was she was various, so she had bow legs and she had pain on the inside of her knee. Well, if you look at this X-ray, this is a front view of the X-ray. Um, and we can see that actually there's joint space between the two, maybe slightly narrowed on the inside of the knee. And as time goes on, that's beginning to narrow a bit further. You can now see there's just a slither of cartilage left between the two joint surfaces. 
we're now down to bone on bone osteoarthritis and when we grade arthritis we grade this as grade four because the two bone surfaces are in contact with each other but on the outside of the knee you still have preservation of the joint space however if you leave it too long you'll get to this and this is a rotten joint you know there is no cartilage poor patient has got uh, widespread osteoarthritis but this was a study that was done by the rheumatologists and they've done they they've done longitudinal studies looking at how osteoarthritis progresses and this is what happens this is perhaps my favorite slide that was given to me this is not my own slide roman sale who is a, um, a friend of the team um, put this slide up and basically he was the uh, president of the european society for uh, sports and, uh, and knee trauma and it's a traffic light system what we're trying to do is keep people in the green so you can see in these pictures here we've got ligament surgery so we're repairing the ligaments we've got um, acl surgery uh, here we've got a uh, bracing to try and take the pressure off the um, arthritic joint and we've got osteotomy so osteotomy which is what the topic of today really um, is keeping patients in a safe place where we've done nothing to the knee joint itself we then go to, down to the go up to the amber and you can see we're starting to look at joint replacement surgery this first picture you see here is a partial knee replacement and then next to it is the total knee replacement now once you're in the amber there's no going back into the green your only way is going up the slope and sadly this is what happens when things start to fail or these are the next steps in the treatment algorithm and that's either revision arthroplasty uh, so these are revision knee replacements this is a fusion and and so is this and in the worst case scenarios and thankfully this is incredibly rare um, amputation so what are we talking about today well we're talking about osteotomy surgery and some of you may have come across this and some of you may have not osteotomy is not a new concept its history dates back into back to pre um, 1940s and you can see here this poor patient on this table um, undergoing a, a stretching procedure to try and straighten the limb so even even then these are these are really old ancient these are ancient pictures demonstrating that um, you know this was something that was always considered in the past however this was the first person to really talk about um, collecting data so this is William McEwen and he looked into the etiology and pathology as this paper says of um, being knock kneed and bow legged and he was really the first person to publish anything on it and he did a lot of work you can see he did 835 osteotomies um, um, in, in 557 limbs in 330 patients so there's some repeat customers and he even um, did a follow-up study um, for, for 45 uh, patients and he didn't really say what what length of time that was over and and you know we now use very sophisticated patient reported outcome measures but the gross things that he looked at was are they able to stand up and walk do, does the appearance look good and what do they go back into and these were just some of the uh, professions that they went back into so iron mongers cloth lappers book binders miners and dressmakers so really interesting paper but the whole point of this is to demonstrate that actually this is not a new procedure it just fell out of favor so why did it fall out of favor well we got really good at doing joint replacements you can see here there's an array of replacements that we can do from um, from partial knee replacements of the lateral compartment through to bilateral partial knee replacements of the medial compartment through to combined replacements partial replacements of the medial part of the knee and the patellofemoral joint all the way through to total knee replacements so and, and this was largely driven by industry and a lot of marketing went into this and um, patients were getting joint replacements so why should you consider osteotomy what does it do and what is it hoping to achieve well you're trying to unload the damaged area of the knee joint and try and retention the natural ligaments around the knee we hope to improve uh, movement and it can be done in combination with other procedures by that i mean you can do combined ligament procedures and combined meniscus procedures 
What are the ideal indications for somebody undergoing a tibial osteotomy? Well, it's normally if somebody's got isolated compartment pain, so whether that's medial or lateral, whether they have a low BMI, ideally have a high demand activity. These patients are really fit and active patients. And of course, an osteotomy will only work if there's malalignment. Patients who are not suited are those who are obese. They've got large fixed flexion deformities greater than 25 degrees, and I'm sure we will all agree that's a huge fixed flexion deformity. And they've got a multi-compartment disease. So this is back to, this is JB, and we're just looking at here from the frontal plane. You can now clearly see, so we've had the discussion about varus and valgus, that this patient is in, in, in varus. And we know that this particular condition is more common in, in the male population. But not all varus is, is, um, is, is, is um, pathological. So you can see here, next time you're watching sports, you're watching, uh, the, whoever's watching the Six Nations, next time you're watching um, the player about to take a kick, you, will, you should all notice that the majority of them are in varus. And there's studies to demonstrate that if you are slightly in varus, that gives you a mechanical advantage when you're playing sports. And, you, and the same goes for the footballers. So we see it really commonly in, in, um, in stranger sports. And this is a brilliant example. We know that when you're in a single leg stance, you go into adduction. And here, the, the, this is a really good example of a varus leg going into further adduction. So what happens if you're, um, if you're in, in varus when, you're, when you start off? Well, actually, you're, when you're young, you can, you can be in valgus and gradually come towards neutral. And this graph demonstrates that if you're actually starting off in more varus, as time goes on, your varus will continue to get worse. And in, patient, in people who are controlled, i.e. non-sporting patients compared to the soccer players, the soccer players have a greater uh, majority of people who are in varus compared to people who don't play soccer. So this is a really interesting study. So this is an example, one of our um, German patients. I'll just um, uh, play, play the video here. And look at that, it's really impressive, the degree of varus. And some of you will be able to pick up that there is a varus thrust. So for every step he takes, the, the varus worsens and you get a, get a thrust type gait. So we know that if you have a deformity from the frontal plane, so looking from the front in the patient, that if you've got a, a deformity greater than a small amount, three degrees is nothing, it's absolutely nothing. But we know that if you have that, that it will eventually likely lead to osteoarthritis and it should be corrected if symptomatic. So we know that um, there's a three times greater risk um, uh, for osteoarthritis and progression worsens we're, um, up to 20, 10 to 20 um, times faster with the deformity. So this is an exaggerated diagram of what we're looking at. You can see this is the femur, this is the tibia, the shin bone, and this is the fibula. And this patient's red line is going through the medial compartment of the knee. So this is known as varus. And doing an osteotomy in the tibia makes the weight-bearing axis go through the middle of the knee joint and thereby taking the pressure off the medial aspect of the knee joint and simply putting it through the middle of the knee and making the joint line horizontal. So we know you can get up to three degrees of acceptable um, uh, changes of the joint line. So it's either parallel or within three degrees is acceptable. But when somebody is in con considerable varus, that deformity is greater than three degrees. The other interesting thing about this slide is worth noting is that I often get patients who have deformity that once we've corrected, um, no longer have to wear their foot orthotics. So it really alters their biomechanics. It's quite, it's a very powerful procedure. So once again, um, unilateral osteoarthritis is an indication. One may consider this in congenital deformities or patients who've gone um, through having had previous trauma. And I'll demonstrate these in a few examples. So when a patient has established um, degenerative joint disease, that's what, that's, D, that's what DJD stands for, 
Um, the patient does lots of activities. They've got unicompartmental disease. They've got good range of movement, so no significant fixed flexion deformity. However, they've got a um, frontal deformity. They're good for an osteotomy. So let's look at some cases. This is a, um, a patient um, of one of my colleagues. Uh, he's a 36-year-old uh, footballer, so he's at the end of his uh, footballing career, um, and he's played as a defender. And you can see in this picture uh, quite an impressive uh, varus. And he's had, like a lot of the footballers, has had bilateral ACL surgery. Interestingly, you can also see on this side view that the tibia is sitting forward on the femur, so his ACL is not really working as well as it should do. And by offloading, doing this tibial cut, so what we've done here is made a cut in the bone, we've opened up the medial side of the knee and taken the leg from being bow leg to being straight and fixed with this plate. Um, he's offloaded the medial compartment. And this poor chap, who's only 36 years of age, you can see that the medial joint space is completely shut down. And this gave this, gave this patient a really good result, is able to... Uh, become a trainer and a scout. So it does give people um, their life back. This is another patient, once again, a young patient um, has who's previously had ligament surgery. These are the screws from the previous ligament surgery. This is a nuclear medicine scan. And you can see on the right side, there's a high signal uptake on the medial aspect of the knee joint in the right knee and not so much in the left knee. And that's because this patient had a meniscectomy. So that's the medial meniscus. Um, and a failed ACL reconstruction. They did really well with um, an offloader brace, and by simply correcting their, their alignment, you can offload the medial part of the knee joint. So we, this, this is the particular implant that I use a lot, but the more important point is, is the example. A um, 47-year-old male with increasing pain, bilateral, very isolated, to, to specifically isolated to the medial compartment, keeping them awake at night, difficulty doing any exercise and activity. And we did a trial of bracing. So you can give the patient a brace, and if it gets rid of their pain, that's a really good indicator that doing an osteotomy uh, would help. Of course, we did the standard um, imaging, so a uh, simple x-ray, an MRI scan, and these long leg alignment views. And these lines are going from the center of the hips down to the center of the ankles, and you can see the weight-bearing axis, instead of going through the middle of the knee, is going through the inner aspect of the knee joint. Now, these are um, arthroscopic uh, pictures. And just so you can orientate yourself, these are the compartments of the knee. So this raggedy-looking appearance here is the medial compartment of the knee joint. Uh, this is cartilage, which is fraying and uh, essentially is osteoarthritic. You can see on the femoral condyle, there's osteoarthritis here as well, and it just doesn't look very nice. Um, compared to this picture on the bottom right, where you, we have the lateral meniscus, a really nice looking lateral tibial plateau and lateral femoral condyle. So this patient's perfect for an osteotomy. We no longer do arthroscopies as part of our osteotomy correction. We simply do it based on clinical examination and MRI findings. And the reason why we don't combine it with an arthroscopy is that because we think it affects the uh, recovery from, from the procedure because you're doing um, an additional procedure. So we've stopped doing that. This is just x-rays from the operation itself. So when we do the procedure, we pass some wires as to where we're going to do the osteotomy cut. We pass this, um, this uh, metal retractor behind the tibia, because as you can imagine, when we're going to cut the bone, there's a risk of a real risk of injuring the nerves and blood vessels at the back of the knee, which is why you can imagine a lot of surgeons don't like doing this operation because it's technically demanding and the risks can, are devastating. Um, once we've done that cut, we open up the osteotomy and you can see this leaves a gap here with um, the side, we call this the hinge, uh, remaining intact. And in our practice, and this has now been popularized around the world, but we initially did all the work on this, was to fill that gap with donated bone graft. So we, so uh, patients who undergo hip replacement surgery can donate their hips to be used for this sort of procedure. The hips get processed, and we fashion a, um, a um, bone wedge to put in the gap, 
and fix it with plates and screws. And this patient had it done um, at the same time on both sides, which is quite big surgery, but, um, but he was fit, well, keen to get it done. And this is then post-op. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to this picture on the right. You can see the line drawn from the center of the hips down to the center of the ankles goes now through the middle of the, of the knee joint. Traditionally, these are corrections. This line would be made to go through the outside of the knee. And we know that's not a good thing to do, to completely take the weight-bearing axis to the outside of the knee joint, because that then progresses the disease in the lateral compartment. In, by doing this, you offload the medial compartment of the knee and you, you don't over-pressurize the lateral side. Um, this is um, just demonstrating we can do this through minimally invasive approach. This is another patient who we have done a bilateral simultaneous um, uh, um, osteotomy. Uh, we use these cryocompression devices. This, these particular ones are game ready. We now use PhysioLab. Um, they're, they're really, really effective, and we find the PhysioLabs are, um, are the patients are really happy with them. And in the ideal candidate, um, you can do this in one sitting. And obviously, you know, we've presented our um, papers on this, and this is particular example is an anecdote, but patients can have very little pain after surgery. Um, and this is this is her, the same patient as you, we, we saw earlier, um, uh, ten days post surgery, just coming in for wound review, and you can see thanks to the. Um, the uh, cryocompression devices and the patient not overdoing it. The the swelling is minimal within the knee joint, uh, with not too much pain, and happily mobilising uh, with the crutches. So this is really this has been revolutionary um, in our practice, and we're, so far it's, it's it's working well. So we don't just do corrections in the tibia. Sometimes you have to do them in the femur. Um, this is an example of an um, anaesthetist who had this um, osteochondral defect. So this is the lateral femoral condyle. Um, this is the front of the knee. So here's the patella. This is the femur. This is the tibia. And my arrow is now going to around the cartilage surface. And you can see here there's a big defect with this bit of cartilage that's um, uh, coming off. And you can imagine in a 26-year-old, this is devastating. So what was the, the initial treatment was to pin it back into place um, and try and hold it there. And you can see here the, the screws that are holding it in place, but there's already evidence of osteoarthritis because of, the, because of the alignment. And because this particular patient was in valgus, they overloaded the lateral part of the knee, so this particular fixation failed. And you can see here there's a crevice once again and um, this is this is now um, a devastating uh, situation. And so what was done was that the patient underwent a distal femoral osteotomy to offload. So now we're talking about someone who's in valgus, which is when you're knock-kneed, taken from a valgus position into making them straight. And these are just some MRI scans demonstrating actually that whole osteochondral defect area went on to heal. So we did nothing within, so Chris Wilson, who did this procedure, did nothing to the joint itself, just simply took the pressure off the lateral side of the knee and allowed this osteochondral defect to eventually heal, and the patient was pain-free. So it's incredibly powerful. So this is just to say that we do corrections at the site of deformity. The old adage has always been that if you have a, a, a bow-leggedness, you correct it in the tibia. Or if you have um, knock knees, you correct it in the femur. We know from studies that actually the deformities can arise from either bone. You just have to do a proper analysis of the patient in front of you. I use a computer software to be able to identify where the deformity is coming from and where the correction needs to happen. And I also plan the degree of correction that's required before surgery so that we can make it precise. So the reason why it's important to do that is because if you do the correction in the wrong bone, you can end up in this terrible situation here where you, you have an oblique joint line and patients will not thank you for doing that. Now, if someone's got severe disease, 
and sometimes they're very bow-legged or very knock-kneed, in order to be able to get them straight again, you need to do the correction in two bones. It's tempting to be able to do it in one bone because that's less technically challenging. However, if you do that, if you overcorrect in a single bone, instead of having a joint line that's parallel or within zero to four degrees of being parallel, and you end up with something where it's a complete angle, you overload the um, healthy cartilage and that gives a bad outcome for the patient. And that was borne out in papers done by Babis et al, uh, published in 2002. And he suggested that you should do the correction in two bones so that you um, don't correct and you don't create an abnormal joint line. So this is an example, rather extreme example of the mechanical axis. It's a bit too much to one side, it's missed the foot here, but you get the picture that it's actually missing the medial joint line. This is a better picture here on the on the right here. You can see the starting in the femoral head, ending up in the center of the ankle. And instead of the previous patients where you can still see the weight bearing axis going through the medial compartment of the knee, it's now just skimming the medial side of the knee joint. And this x-ray demonstrates on the outside of the knee a really good cartilage space. However, on the medial aspect of the knee is completely shut down, this thinning of the cartilage. And this is a young patient who's got medial knee pain. So I'm just going to turn the volume down. And you can see, once again, similar to the other patient, we, we demonstrated quite severe uh, varus just by looking at them from the front. But this is exacerbated when you ask the patient to walk. It's really important when you're examining these patients, you get them to walk um, um, as part of your uh, physical exam. These are, so we, this, this is just some of the uh, deformity analysis that we do. And please don't worry about the figures. I just want you to understand that actually the deformity was arising from both the tibia um, and the femur. And if we just simply did a deformity correction of the tibia, you create a really abnormal um, joint line. And so you need to do it both in the femur and the tibia uh, to create normal biomechanics in the knee joint. And these are just the figures that we plan based on our um, osteotomy planning and you can see uh, I think just showing off here really happy with the with the outcome but you can see a nice straight limb and really happy with the sort of degree um, of discomfort now these are large plates um, and they they are taken out um, after a year once everything's healed um, but normally it doesn't hamper their rehabilitation so this is just to show that actually it's not just a one-off. This is a regular thing that we do. The same patient that we saw um, earlier, this gentleman is a bit younger, uh, unable to do any sports, pain on activities of daily living on both sides. And this, he underwent the same procedure with the weight-bearing axis now going through the middle of the knee joint. Now it's, and you can see that it's not always um, young patients. This poor lady, um, is 65 years of age, um, having pain on activities of daily living, really, really valgus here. Um, you know, and, and normally this patient would probably get a, a joint replacement. Now, doing a joint replacement in someone who's got this degree of deformity presents its own challenges and can be very difficult to correct. And while it is certainly achievable, the results aren't as good as someone who's actually got a um, a, a limb that's not severely malaligned. So given the degree of um, deformity, we, um, the patient underwent a double level um, osteotomy and they got back into horse riding and able to do um, activities of daily living without any major discomfort. This was a really interesting gentleman um, that um, I met on my fellowship. Um, he is a weightlifter, um, and, which he does recreationally for fun, but he's got these horrific bow, bow legs you can see. And on the x-rays here, you can see that the medial joint space is completely narrowed. And this is the sort of activity that he enjoys doing, um, throwing uh, kettlebells. He's a really strong man. And he said to, uh, he's actually my, um, on my fellowship with Adrian, and he said, look, Adrian, I would like both done at the same time. Um, you know, I want to get on with my life. And this, this is not the kind of patient you would want to be doing a total knee replacement in. So we, we, we took the challenge and did a bilateral double level um, osteotomy. 
there's a rather large uh, correction as you can see here the gap that we had to open up to and fill with bone graft um, both in the femur and the tibia and you can see um, the starting point where the weight bearing axis is missing the joint and it's going through um, through the middle of the joint so what's changed uh, recently well we would once again it's not just about showing off that we're able to do incision, do small incisions. We know that small incision surgery is um, associated with less pain. Um, so, and and you know it's definitely doable. But in the past, um, these incisions used to be um, at three or four times the size, and um, so it does really help with their pain management. Here's another recent advance that I mentioned earlier that we use this bone wedge. We fashion, having done a pre-operative planning knowing exactly how much we're going to open the osteotomy gap with we fashion a bone wedge and we call this a precision bone wedge because we make it exactly the right size for the osteotomy opening and we can fix that in place so what are the outcomes it's all well and good talking about procedures that we we do and we're, we're in favor of but we've got to base it on science and research and we're just going to talk a bit about the results here so we know that if you've got the, the tibial bone varus um, angle, that actually the greater the deformity, as you can see from here, the better the results. So if you've got greater uh, varus angle of more than five degrees at 10 years, you can get 83% um, good to excellent results. So that's, that's important. Can you get back into sports after having osteotomy surgery? Well, the papers suggest that you can. The only papers, the only things that we haven't looked at yet, and we don't have data on, or strong data on, is in professional sports. So uh, Nagel et al. in 1996 looked at 37 patients and found that after surgery, 26 were carrying, carrying heavy loads, and there were uh, 10 running more than three times a week. And these are the kind of sports they were getting back into. The ACL study group of Sardinia in 2004 did suggest that people can get back into playing um, playing uh, professional sport. I would err on the side of caution here because actually really uh, looking at the data for larger numbers, we just simply don't have that information as yet. But there's no reason why uh, patients don't go back into recreational activity. We also demonstrated to you earlier the double level osteotomies. And you think that looks like a major procedure are the outcomes going to be good? Well, actually, the survivorship, so patients not requiring joint replacement surgery, is really good um, um, at seven years in this particular study. And anecdotally, these are what these are the sort of things that our patients get back into. You know, they can they can go um, skiing, uh, climbing, uh, playing tennis. You know, we 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 do expect our patients to get into a high level of activity. Now, to show that it's not it's not just uh, for young patients, we don't tend to do it in really in very old patients. But in Japan, uh, one of my friends and colleagues sent me a couple of videos of his patients who are in their 80s, and you can see here that this is sort of physiotherapy. I wouldn't dream of doing three months after um, after osteotomy surgery, and just to show that it wasn't a one-off, um, he sent us a video of another 81-year-old running up and down the corridor. Um, <laughs> it's quite amusing, but but you know it, it's a powerful message to say, say that it's not just something that we do for the chronological young patients. Um, even if you're physiologically young, um, this can be an option for you. This is just some demonstration of the rehab afterwards. Um, you know, it sounds like they get um, sort of you know good good intensive input. And the kind of range you can expect and, and look at these x-rays they sorry let me just turn that off i mean these x-rays demonstrate bone on bone arthritis and you know traditionally these patients would be having joint replacements i'm now going to talk a little bit about the um, deformity looking at the knee from the side so far we've been looking at it from the front and we know that this is really important and this is going to come on all of your radars very soon um, because we know that people who undergo ligament surgery whose tibial plateau is not parallel to the floor, but actually slopes backwards or slopes forwards, can affect their cruciate ligaments adversely. And you can see here, in this instance, you can 
it can affect your PCL, and if it's the other way, it can affect your ACL. And this is really important because we're now recognizing if we don't get that slope correct, patients are, are rupturing their ACLs and PCLs uh, prematurely. And you can see if you run a ball down at the tibial plateau, it's just going to keep on rolling because it's not flat. So we know that there's increased forces, the greater the slope you have, and these forces are huge. You know, if you're going up to 20 degrees of increased uh, tibial slope, the forces going through the knee joint are up to over 500 newtons. That is absolutely massive. So this was a, a, a patient of ours who'd had some congenital deformity um, and the, the slope of this tibial plateau is pointing um, backwards. It should be flat, but you can see it's sloping down to the front of the knee um, and is measured at 76 degrees. And the presentation was um, this hyperextension. You can see here that he's hyperextending on the affected side. And this can cause pain, discomfort, and it can cause premature failure of ligaments. So, this was a big operation. We took the front of the tibial tubercle off and um, did a slope changing correction. So you can see this is big surgery. Um, I, won't, I won't play that for too long, but just to show you that we were able to correct the slope and stop the hyperextension. And he's he's got back into his job. Um, I believe he was a roofer and he's absolutely delighted. This is a patient who'd had trauma. Now, this is something that we tragically see a lot. Somebody who'd had a road traffic accident and they broke their tibia. When they broke their tibia, unfortunately, the fixation failed and the actual plateau was never reduced adequately. And this 37-year-old um, gentleman came in with failure of fixation and malunion. And you can see, um, once again, quite severe varus loading on a medial compartment of the knee that is pretty much non-existent. So this was a difficult case. In all the previous cases we've seen, uh, patients are in varus, but they've got a normal medial plateau. This chap has got an abnormal plateau. And you can see there's a big hole in the tibia. And so this is, a, this is not a normal situation. So we put our heads together, it was myself, um, uh, Adrian Wilson, and our friend and uh, colleague, uh, Ronald van Heerwarden from Holland. And so what we did was we took all, all the hardware, we removed the plateau, and we put in a donated uh, medial plateau, which we, which we fixed in place. Um, I'll, I'll show you where it came from. So this is somebody's tibia. Um, so somebody who's donated their tibia to be used um, for, for medical purposes. We, we fashioned um, a new medial plateau for this patient so that it would fit him, uh, it would be the exact same size, and we put it in place here. So with this x-ray, you can see a brand new tibial plateau, and we fixed it in with some screws. Now, this patient was in varus, and there's no way that this would have healed if we kept the patient in varus. So at the same time, um, we did a double level osteotomy. So underneath the, um, the new bone wedge, as well as in the femur, so that his weight bearing axis, instead of going through his brand new tibial plateau, was going through the middle of the knee joint. This is five weeks um, after, after surgery, and um, you can see um, we're beginning to get some quadriceps control, able to straight leg raise, um, minimal swelling once again, that's thanks to some cryo compression and uh, just keeping the leg elevated and just stressing the medial collateral ligament was nice and stable. And this is him, he unfortunately put on a fair bit of weight afterwards, but he was really happy with the outcome of his operation. He was getting around a lot more. Uh, he was able to run his own business, and um, he was pain-free. I'm just going to move play on. 
brilliant so so that's 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 been really effective and that's the sort of thing that one can do but it, this is challenging challenging to do so having spent most of my time today talking about um preservation surgery it's important to know that the fallback option is joint replacement surgery if required in the right patients i'm sure you can appreciate from these x-rays there's quite extensive disease affecting the knee joint both in the right and the left knee and with bone on bone osteoarthritis with associated deformity there's no role here for joint preservation this is um, advanced osteoarthritis and in the right patients like this gentleman here you can do bilateral simultaneous total knee replacement surgery um, they have to be medically fit they have to be really on board to have this done and perhaps we do this once or twice a year but it can be incredibly rewarding and this is him just a few hours after surgery um, just to show show that he was much the same when we saw him back in back in clinic um let's see his movement sorry he was he was absolutely delighted And he really wanted to talk about it a lot. So yeah, no, that, it can be it can be incredibly rewarding. So we do total knee replacements for people who've got, been people who've got multi compartment disease and they're not sort of suitable for an osteotomy or a partial knee replacement. Um, I'm showing this lady because this lady I treated um, uh, a few years ago now when I started my consultant uh, post, and um, I did her staged. So I did one at a time. And she was so pleased uh, with her outcomes that she went to the papers and we were in the Telegraph for um, having done this kind of uh, surgery with a rapid rehabilitation. I would like to take credit for it, but I think it was just the fact that the patient was so motivated. Um, she did uh, really well. Uh, this lady was physically back in the gym doing lots of exercise and just showing off her function here in clinic. Just, and I was sorry to have to discharge her. Um, she was great fun to look after. And these are just her x-rays. So just to wrap things up, we know that the National Joint Registry demonstrates a higher revision rate in patients who are under the age of 60 when they undergo joint replacement surgery. We know that you get poorer outcomes in joint replacements in younger patients, particularly the male population. And there's a certainly an increased disability amongst the younger population. However, alternatives to arthroplasty are clearly available. What does the future hold? Now, this is joint distraction. You can see here the picture on the left is heading towards either having this quite extensive disease, which is just not suitable for osteotomy surgery. Work done in Holland demonstrates that if you separate the two joints using this external fixator for six weeks, you can significantly reduce the pain from the osteoarthritis. And it's about the only um, modality that we know surgically that can help to regenerate some, some cartilage based on MRI studies. This is not very palatable for patients. You can imagine wearing this contraption for six weeks. So hopefully the technology is going to improve with better, better hardware. But I think this is something that's quite exciting for the future.